medieval history. Today we are going to look at something that I call the grim 14th century. That During the, the 1300s there's this period of climactic cooling uh, and it, uh, it causes a lot of social stresses and it may have ushered in uh, a, a enormous famine within pan-European society and really across the world but with this famine brings malnutrition, which uh, it really hurts people's immune systems. Birth rates begin to go down. People are malnourished. They are hungry, um, and they are looking for things to blame. Then comes this great dying that we call often call the Black Death, uh, and where uh, between, depending on the estimates, uh, between 30 and 70% uh, of the population dies, and, and it, it differentiates in, it based on areas, and urban areas are much more harshly hit than, than more rural areas. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, that uh, probably at least 50% of the population of the world dies in a matter of three or four years. Um, so uh, this is a, a tumultuous event, uh, and along with this, there are other major stresses on uh, on the pan-European world, and and uh, we're going to look at some of these. And uh, the, but the the church is in schism; that there are rival popes. At one time, there are three popes, uh, all claiming to be legitimate. Uh, so there there are are enormous stresses within the religious world. As I say, there is are uh, famines, there is plague. And, uh, and, and finally, there is this, this problem of warfare, endemic warfare, all across the European continent, which we call the Hundred Years' War. So we're going to look at really at two of these, these great stresses during the 14th century, and that is the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War, in some detail. As I, I mentioned here, that we have um, all of these large-scale stresses that we just simply don't see in the, in the century uh, before this, uh, we're, and we're going to see a continuation of this through the, uh, the period of the Protestant Reformation and the wars of religion uh, that will follow that uh, during the 16th century. But it, uh, the, the High Middle Ages was really a time of increasing uh, productivity, urbanization, trade. Uh, the population is on the rise. Demographics are going up. Um, and, uh, and things are looking really good until about the, the uh, 1320 or so, and then, then it all just sort of begins to go downhill, and the world uh, takes on a much more uh, negative look. So let us begin by looking at the Hundred Years' War. Now, the Hundred Years' War, if you carefully look at these dates here, is not actually a Hundred Years' War. It didn't make it quite a Hundred Years exactly. Um, it's actually a little longer than a hundred years, but uh, uh, nevertheless, um, this is a conflict really between England and France and their allies um, that uh, that was a series of periodic engagements over the course of of uh, more than a hundred years uh, between uh, the militaries, and it was all over a question of of dynastic succession. So Edward III is going to claim, who is king of England, is going to claim that he is, uh, through his mother, uh, he is the rightful king of France, and there's a, there's a big, uh, big argument over this because the king of France um, is, is, uh, is technically because the kings of England are dukes of Normandy. Uh, that technically the king of England is the feudal vassal of the king of France. And there, this will be a, a point of contention throughout the Middle Ages between the kings of England and France. But uh, Edward III is going to, to claim um, that, that, um, uh, that he is actually the king of France through his, through his mother's side, that he, ha he has more of a, of a claim uh, to the throne. When the, uh, the Capetian uh, dynasty of France... Uh, concludes with the last last king, uh, Philip Augustus, and, and uh, um, Edward III is going to sort of claim the French throne, and uh, the the Parlement uh, and uh, the States General are going to select uh, instead Charles uh, of Valois to to become the king of England. 
Edward III is going to contest this, and so therefore um, it, uh, uh, it all is going to, to uh, snowball, and eventually uh, they are going to, to uh, just uh, go to war over this because, because uh, both sides will, will not give in or, or recognize the other. They all say that they violated uh, customary laws, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what the, the great argument of succession here is can one inherit through the matrilineal line of uh, of bloodline meaning can i succeed to the throne or a uh, a high feudal office um through my mother's side and the question to that is only if it's absolutely necessary <laughs> so um it has happened but it's rare uh, only in the, uh, when when it is essential for uh, for the continuation of a good ruling dynasty can you invoke the uh, the, the matrilineal uh, bloodline. But typically within the medieval world, it is the patrilineal inheritance that is is going to be followed. So it's your father, the male side, um, that is going to to uh, be who succeeds, rather than the matrilineal. So uh, the traditional Salic law of, of the, for going all the way back to the time of, of Clovis, uh, uh, which is the sort of the traditional law, uh, it, it, they argue uh, here that an, a particular interpretation of this law is that the, the, a title or a crown going all the way back into the early, early Middle Ages, time immemorial, if you will, um, can only pass through the male line. This is the French argument. And... Uh, Edward the, and, and through this, uh, then Edward III, King of England, because he would have to inherit through his mother. Now, Edward III is a more, uh, uh, more direct, if, you, if he can go through his mother, uh, who was the daughter of a French king. Um, he's more direct descendant than is Charles of, of, uh, of Valois, who eventually would become Philip VI. Um, so... The Estates General, which is the great meeting of all the social orders of England, so the nobles, the, the clergy, and the uh, and the, uh, the the lower orders, come together in this great great meeting, uh, and they they decide that they will they will follow uh, that that they will settle this question. They will follow the Salic Law, uh, and they they uh, in, in that decree bar Edward the Third from from uh, ex- uh, getting the crown of France. So Edward III takes issue with this and decides he's going to go to war against a particularly weak king in Charles of Valois. And the Hundred Years' War is one that is fought over a series, like I say, a series of, of more than a hundred years. Uh, but uh, in, uh, it's fought in, in, uh, in particular phases. It's not a continuous war though it probably would have seemed like a continuous war if you had lived there. So, But uh, this, uh, this causes enormous problems that when you have these um, just continuous and endemic warfare uh, throughout your, your land, it, it, uh, it causes enormous stresses to be placed upon um, your, your agricultural production, uh, your, your, uh, your peasantry in, the, in that uh, these armies are going to be marching around, and, and they don't have careful supply lines that they, they live off the land. So they're going to take and appropriate anything that they, they want or, and need from the countryside, and that includes all your grain and your animals and anything that they want or need because, well, they're an army and you're not. So it, uh, this is very problematic if you are living in areas where armies are fighting. And, uh, and we're going to look at these phases. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly as, as uh, we don't need to, to know every single detail that I have on here. Um, but uh, ultimately here, phase one is that Edward is going to try to regain the, uh, the old English... Uh, um, um, territories that had been lost over the course of some of the Middle Ages going back and forth. So he, he really wants to get back Normandy. He would really love to get back Aquitaine, uh, the counties in France, and and, uh, uh, and, and ultimately they, they, uh, their goal is to 
to defeat the French army in a pitched battle. Now, the, at the Battle of Crecy, uh, which is where, for the first time, you see the uh, use of the, the longbow, and this is huge. Uh, the English here uh, are able to defeat uh, the Mounted Knight, which is sort of the, the premier weapon in, West, or in, in Europe until, um, un, until the advent of the longbow and the, the Swiss pike, and there's a few other weapons that, that allow for the, uh, the defeat of, of a Mounted Knight by a, a, a less expensive, less well-trained uh, soldier in, in the English longbowman. And uh, the English, after they, they win an enormous victory at Crecy, uh, where the, the French knights charge the field and, and they um, draw up with their, their new weapon, which we're going to look at in just a moment, the English longbow, and they're able to just win a stunning victory against uh, what was believed to be the, you know, the glory and pride of, of, uh, of the European uh, military in the, in the French knights, mounted French knight. Uh, with their big heavy plate armor and their enormous uh, their their training and their enormous war horses and, and these kinds of things, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, then uh, the the, uh, uh, the the English are going to of course win again at the Battle of uh, Poitiers, and let's uh, we will look at that. So let us uh, let us just look at the English longbow. So what made this weapon? so powerful and much and allow somebody who is is not a mounted or well-trained knight who has spent uh, years and years training to be a professional warrior able to defeat the the glory and pride of the french army so an english longbow is a very long bow <laughs> for lack of a better term it's about six feet long which made it different than others so it's uh, it's hard to shoot it has a, an enormous pull on it that could be up to 120 pounds which gives it incredible knockdown power and the ability to penetrate plate armor that were within uh, that, that the mounted knight wore um, and uh with the advan this this gives the English a distinct advantage in that they could never rival the French in the amount of knights that they produced or the quality of knight that they produced, uh, and uh, and by having a, a longbowman who can be trained in a matter of weeks uh, to 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 uh, uh, defeat a mounted knight that takes seven ten years to train, uh, uh, you can you can have a much cheaper and much, uh, m you can raise forces much more quickly, and, and ultimately it is, uh, it's, it's much, much less expensive to, to put these guys on the field in much larger numbers, and, and, uh, and they, can, they can defeat uh, knights uh, when, uh, when they are well-trained and uh, used in conjunction with other types of soldiers. So this gives the English an enormous advantage within the, the, uh, the first stages of the Hundred Years' War. And... Um, Really, you don't see another weapon that could be fired as quickly that had more knockdown power than the English longbow. Uh, the the Asiatic nomads had uh, their their uh, their compound bows that had as as much knockdown power as the longbow, uh, but uh, and could be fired as quickly, if not quicker. Um, but but you don't see another weapon with more knockdown power that could be fired more quickly until you get to the, the really the, the repeater rifle in the, the 1840s uh, uh, and uh, 1850s. So it's, a, it's a, just an enormously powerful weapon that revolutionizes warfare in, in Europe. So here we see the, uh, uh, at the, the Battle of Poitiers where the, the longbow is really used to devastating effect um, for uh, the first time. Um, and what happens here is that there was uh, this king, uh, and his uh, he's called John the Good, the French king, and he is uh, he he tries his best in battle, and they sort of pat him on the head uh, at the end of this because he he doesn't really he's not a great soldier, and again you get a title like the Good, the Blessed, the. Uh, the confessor, general rule in medieval history, you were not a good king in the sense of you were not a good warrior. And uh, so John tries to charge the English cavalry 
up a hill, and uh, his his, uh, his forces are just decimated by this this longbow, and they get stuck in the mud. And eventually, he uh, he agrees to be uh, uh, or that they capture him, and uh, he has to be uh, uh, ransomed uh, back to uh, his army at an enormous price. Um, and and uh, uh, there is a uh, the, the, the tax is so high that there is actually the, the Jacquerie, this leads to the Jacquerie Rebellion uh, throughout Paris. And you can kind of think of the Jacquerie as the, the sort of the Joe Sixpack uh, kind of guys uh, that work in, 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 in and around Paris. So uh, they, they, uh, they rise up and eventually it, uh, they're put down and, and the nobility have to agree to pay. And it's, it just puts an enormous amount of stress on on, uh, on the French and uh, their countryside uh, in order to get this king back who is not a very good king. And eventually uh, England will win really big out of this. They will get uh, an enormous amount of lands and a very high ransom um, for King John. So uh, this was not a good period for the, uh, uh, for the French army. Phase two of the war. Um, let us begin by examining this. Um, so the English, again, are going to win pretty big out of this phase of the war. They're going to win again at the, uh, the Battle of Agincourt, which is, is one of the really, the, the truly the greatest victories, uh, by the, the in the medieval, uh, in medieval England, and it's, it's remembered as, as this. And, um... England is going to win back all of Normandy and many of its other lands, but at the Battle of Agincourt, uh, when the English win, and, and again, through the use of their longbow, uh, they are able to win a stunning and, and just crushing victory uh, over the, uh, the French army. And uh, it was the English had a superior position up on top of a hill, and there was a, a heavy rain on the field, uh, that day, so the French nobility, in all their heavy armor with their heavy horse, charge the English army, and they get bogged down in the mud. Just it is a massive killing field that is perfectly within range of the longbow, and they decimate uh, the the uh, the French army with their bows. And uh, on that day, forty percent of the French nobility were killed, and the vast uh, majority of the rest were captured on the field that day, and uh, you see the the um, and the problem came because uh, as the English began to go through and and uh, arrest these mud soaked men in armor uh, on the the field and, and detain them, the, they they would begin they would kill many of the soldiers if you were not of of noble line and and uh, but people would begin shouting you know I am the Count of Artois I am the Art the Count of Artois. Uh, meaning that if you don't kill me, I'm worth a lot more to you alive than dead because you can ransom me, and ransom them they did. But the problem is when they began to sort things out, they had about 15 counts of Artois because the, the, uh, the lower-level soldiers and, and, uh, uh, decided that they would uh, didn't want to be murdered on the battlefield and, and claimed to be someone else. Uh, but it was uh, quite a process to sort out who actually was the Count of Artois and uh, various other noble offices. And but uh, the English again win uh, very big, uh, very big in this. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, when uh, the the um, the the end of this phase of the war is the the English kings will actually. Um, they will be named as the heirs after Charles VI in France. Uh, so, so when Charles would die, uh, ultimately they would uh, uh, become kings of, of France. And even Henry VI is, is crowned king of France in, in Paris as, uh, as the heir, that he would be the Dauphin, the, uh, the, the, uh, the named heir after Charles VI. So England, again, wins really big. Eventually, this isn't going to happen. Uh, of course, the, the French would never allow a king of England to be their king. And, they, and like this, they, they didn't. So they fight again. Phase four of the war. 
So this is where we see the very famous Joan of Arc appear. And she is uh, simply a peasant girl who has these, uh, these mystical visions uh, that, uh, that uh, the Virgin Mary came to her in visions of the mother of Christ and, and um, uh, told her that, uh, that she, could, she would have to lead the, uh, the French to victory. And Charles VII, uh, who is, uh, he's the Dauphin, and along with Henry VI, kind of. And, um, but he is the heir apparent, and, and he, uh, he takes a gamble. Because Joan of Arc was extremely powerful, her visions and her her uh, her charisma among the people uh, really inspired them. And he 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 basically says, uh, "Okay, Joan, uh, I'm going to allow you to lead my army, and I'm going to allow you to wear armor and to act like a man and be a general." And uh, so there's a major siege here. And 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 uh, one thing that needs to be said is uh, Joan of Arc was successful ultimately in in rallying the the French troops. But Henry V, who was the great king, uh, the great warrior king of England, um, he dies of dysentery shortly before this period. If Henry V, who is uh, uh, must be remembered and as as one of the greatest warrior kings of England. Um, if he had not died, it is highly unlikely that Joan of Arc would have uh, been successful. Um, but with the death of Henry V and the popularity of, of Joan and her visions, uh, that uh, she was actually able to sort of break the siege of Orléans, which other than uh, Paris, if, if, uh, if, you, if they had taken Orléans, uh, that uh, uh, if she would have opened the gates to Paris and the English army um, could likely have taken Paris after this point. Um, but... Uh, um, Eventually, the uh, uh, Joan breaks the siege um, and um, is able to push the English army back without their great and charismatic leader in Henry V, and uh, and she basically ensures that Charles V is is crowned king. And remember, Henry VI was uh, was made king, or he was a. Uh, 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 He was he was uh, crowned king in Paris, and I think I got my Henrys right. There's a lot of Henrys that go on in here. So Henry, uh, the king of England, was crowned Dauphin in Paris, which is not the traditional place where kings of France are crowned. They're actually crowned in Rheims, and uh, and therefore it was ruled that this was an invalid coronation, which allowed for Charles the Seventh, who who uh, takes a, a risk on Joan of Arc. Uh, um, to to be made king. Now Charles the uh, uh, Char excuse me Charles the seventh, um, when he uh, he after he is crowned king in Rim, he allows Joan to go out and and fight one more battle, and he kind of hangs her out to dry. I mean, he really just sort of lets her be be uh, captured. And indeed, she, she's captured actually by the Burgundians, not the English, uh, which were, is sort of an independent French nation county. Uh, that's, uh, or it's usually a, a county of France, but sometimes its own independent kingdom. And, but the Burgundian army captures Joan. And they go to Charles and they say, we have, we have your, uh, your great uh, hero general here, your mystic, and uh, we'd like to be paid if uh, you want her back. And Charles says, oh, "I'll think about it." And in the meantime, uh, the uh, the English, the the Burgundians say, uh, "Well, we're going to offer to the English if you don't pay." And Charles says, "Well, I'll think about it." And so England says, "Yeah, we'll take her. Here's your ransom." And uh, so the the uh, the Burgundians hand Joan of Arc over, and Charles is in some ways kind of glad to be rid of her because at this point he really doesn't need her. He's, he's pushed the English back. He's firmly on the throne, and, uh, and, and uh, Joan is an expendable asset. So the English remember, not fondly, this, uh, this mystic who basically beat them out of the throne of France. So she is tried as a, as a, for a crimes of, uh, uh, of heresy, 
And indeed, she is convicted, and uh, she was deemed to be a witch and a heretic, and they burn her at the stake in France uh, in uh, 1431. And after this phase of the war, though, the French basically reclaim almost everything that they had, uh, they had lost in the previous uh, hundred years of, of the struggle. That England wins almost every portion of this war, but they lose out on the, on the last and most important portion, uh, and they are pushed out of France. And the only thing that basically remains in France is, is Calais, is just this little port city area in, in France. So what were the consequences of the English war, or excuse me, the Hundred Years' War for the, the English? Um, it's basically going to be determined that the king cannot tax um, directly outside of, of emergencies, uh, that he can only use his own revenues, his traditional feudal dues uh, to, to govern through, and, and will... If you take the modern history class, you will see why this is so important because this leads directly to the English Civil War because the, the king, uh, King Charles, will uh, try to arbitrarily uh, uh, tax people um, and not tax through parliament. Now, parliament becomes extremely more powerful because the king needs a lot of taxes. If you're going to fight these huge wars with these big armies, they're expensive, and the king, through his own revenues, cannot raise armies big enough in the late Middle Ages in order to, um, in order to field armies. So in England, the Hundred Years' Wars actually leads to a more balanced, democratic-styled uh, government, whereas... Whereas in, uh, in France, it's going to lead to a much more uh, uh, arbitrary, royalist, royal absolutist kind of government. So you see a major differentiation uh, in the, the consequences from the Hundred Years' War. Um, so, and then the military transformations, along with these political transformations, um, it's going to bring in... Uh, the age of the professional soldier that uh, kind of no longer after the period of the Hundred Years' War are people going to, to simply rely on their personal retinues of, of uh, knights and retainers and, and, and things like that because uh, the age of the knight is really over after the Hundred Years' War. Um, the, the English longbow has brought about uh, the, the obsolescence of, of the, the mounted knight to any real degree. Though you will, there will still be people called knights, and they will still ride around on horses with armor, uh, the, the age of the knight as the premier weapon is over. And uh, this will be uh, the beginning of uh, profes uh, pr a permanent professional standing armies that no longer will you, will you just have to call up your, your feudal uh, lords and that they will show up and fight. Uh, rather, rather, there will be professionalized armies after this point. So let us shift gears and look at um, some of the other factors for the grim uh, 14th century. So we begin to see a, a, a massive uh, demo demographic crisis, that the population begins to go down after a period of, con of continuous growth for some three or four hundred years. So at the, at the beginning of the 1300s, we see... A, some sort of a, a climate change um, that we see the, the temperature in Europe is going to go down uh, a, a degree or so, and uh, this is going to cause famines. That uh, agricultural productivity is going to decline uh, pretty uh, uh, quite largely, and, uh, and this will bring about these famines, that uh, people are going to be uh, extremely malnourished, uh, and, and it's going to be very problematic that people are literally going to starve to death. And we have in the, the first great famine uh, in the, the uh, 1320s, uh, we begin to see people even resorting uh, to cannibalism, it is reported. Uh, so this is, this is a, a very dire time, and this is across all of Europe. You know, it's just not in a, a small area, but uh, largely in northern Europe uh, that this is, this is extremely problematic. And, uh, and, and as much as 10% of the population dies from starvation during these times. There just simply was not enough food. And we see this again beginning in the 1330s, that uh, another enormous famine comes over uh, uh, all across Europe, 
And this causes uh, uh, malnutrition, weakness, sickness, plague begins to crop up. And then, of course, uh, beginning in the late uh, 1340s, we, we see the arrival of the Black Death. And it is, it is thought that the Black Death was so uh, virulent and successful plague is because people just had no immune systems because they had no food. They were so malnourished during these times uh, that uh, they, they died off. And so it helped to, to make the uh, plague so effective. Now let us look at wages. So if you begin to, to look here, um, that we, this is a, a chart of, of both French and English laborers uh, from the, the Middle Ages for the statistics that we can, can gather. And as I said, uh, the, the 1300s, uh, uh, the, uh, well, the early 1300s, the 1200s, the 1100s, we see uh, very good wage increase, and we see, a, uh, we see pretty decent wages. Um, and, and, and really beginning right about uh, the year 1300 because, uh, because we see such favorable conditions that uh, there is, is such a, an enormous amount of food that people have produced, I mean, they have grown demographically. The number of human beings living is in, has been increasing steadily for three or four hundred years. And therefore, we have labor surpluses. Therefore, if there are, are five laborers and, f and three jobs, uh, the, it is a, 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 a higher, an, employer, an employer's market. So we see this really beginning around uh, 1250, 1275, uh, that um, there's just an enormous surplus of peasant labor. So therefore, wages begin to decline uh, in, enormously. Uh, that the, the value of goods is going up because everybody needs more stuff because there's more people and there's more people, therefore there's less jobs or there's less job opportunities uh, even on uh, uh, an agricultural estate, uh, right? So we see real purchasing power, real wages uh, decline um, until really the, at the, the advent of, of the, uh, uh, the plagues and as well as the, uh, uh, the great famines. And uh, with this, with the decline of the population, we actually see uh, then wages go up enormously because there are, uh, when 50% of the labor market uh, is killed, uh, then uh, you can demand more. Your, your labor becomes enormously more valuable, so people have to pay more in order to get you to work for them. So this is what is happening uh, during these years. And you can see here the population uh, trends uh, that really right as the Black Death hits, uh, especially the, the population is already on a decline because of the, uh, the famines that had occurred early in the 1300s. But really with the, the Black Death showing up at the end of the 1340s, we see massive massive declines in population uh, throughout Europe and the entire world. This is just, of course, a European uh, analysis, but uh, the same. it's the same everywhere all over the world, uh, the, uh, the, the ancient world anyway, um, or the old world, because um, the plague begins in China and it takes over 10 years to, to get to Europe, uh, but it, it goes right along all the trade routes, uh, the, along the Silk Road routes, and it goes right into uh, right into Western Europe, and everywhere we see uh, declines of, of population from anywhere from 30 to to even as high as 70 percent in the, the cities of northern Italy, uh, and, and 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 urban places. It's just uh, it's virulent. So this is not really called the Black Death until later. Uh, it's often referred to as the Great Dying. And within, and I'm just really going to look at Europe. I'm not going to look uh, at uh, at uh, the the entire world, uh, but here uh, it hits Europe and specifically Western Europe uh, from about the year 1347, and uh, and it uh, it takes three years for this this plague to to uh, sort of dissipate. And we see the first recorded case as a as uh, as I say it was it was noted that there was this great plague that was happening um, in the the east on along the trade routes and in the in the the, the great trade cities of, of the uh, of the Silk Road and and, and Baghdad, uh, but it had not quite got to Europe yet. 
and um, this is not the first time that uh, this plague, the the, uh, the bubonic plague, which is what it is is actually called, uh, had hit Europe. But it was in the back in the time of Justinian in the sixth century, uh, there was a virulent uh, outbreak of, of bubonic plague, um, but. Actually, it, uh, it it dissipates, and and it was not seen again until the 1300s. So it, for almost a thousand years, that we had not seen large outbreaks of bubonic plague uh, in the ancient world, at least on a large scale, uh, as it, as it had. But the world had never been so closely connected as it had in uh, um, as it began to be. It became urbanized, and trade and commerce uh, began to to flourish, and, and there was a sort of an international-style trade, a proto-globalism, if you will. Um, and uh, and this connection allows for plague to spread very quickly. And, and uh, so we see the first cases of the bubonic plague arriving in Europe about 1347, when uh, a ship uh, with everyone dead on it basically floats into to a harbor in Sicily. And from there, we see it spread throughout Italy, up into the north of Italy, into France, and finally into England and beyond. Um, what we do know about the Black Death, and, and there is constant and continuous research about this, and certainly with the advent of the coronavirus, I'm sure that there will be a, a new uh, research, uh, there will be much new research into um, the study of the, of the Great Dying, or the Black Death. What we do know is that rats became uh, infected with this plague and that they died off very quickly. Uh, that uh, as, as, uh, and this, this plague comes from fleas. And the, the fleas primary choice of, of, uh, of host, as it is a parasite, uh, it, it, uh, it likes to, to live off the rat, the, the, the black rat in Europe. Um, and uh, the flea, for some reason or the other, uh, it, it will, uh, it, there's sort of this, this, uh, this bacterium called Yersinopestis, and it lives within the digestive tract of the flea. And it will vomit this up. And, uh, and then it will cause the rat to be inflect, infected with this terrible plague. And as the rats die, the fleas need new hosts in order to live, so they move on to humans. And the Middle Ages is not a time of, of, uh, of good hygiene. Uh, people lived with their animals. Uh, it was uh, really uh, horrific in, our, in modern uh, sense of hygiene uh, and uh, uh, sanitation. So there were rats everywhere. There were people that had fleas everywhere. Uh, and it was just a, it was a not a, anything like our modern world. And so therefore the fleas just simply move right onto their human hosts who then uh, move among other human circles, spreading, spreading the fleas. And the fleas would continue to vomit up this uh, Yersinopestis. And then it would, uh, um, it would uh, human hosts would get infected and they would pass it on to other people uh, and it would uh, it would just be a, a really horrific uh, really horrific way to die uh, and there's other theories that this plague was actually pneumonic which like the coronavirus uh, it would be passed through through airborne uh, uh, means that you would you know would cough or get saliva or, you know something of that nature on others uh, and it would be um, uh, spread very rapidly that way that is one theory uh, that, uh, uh, but uh, really, what we do know is that it is passed through through fleas. So when one is is infected with this Yersinopestis, you have bubonic plague, and these things called buboes develop. Um, that uh, they would be these giant black kind of boils, and they would be under your arms and in your lymph nodes, and and. Uh, 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 your groin everywhere it would be uh you would begin to have swelling then uh you would begin to have internal hemorrhaging meaning that you're going to start bleeding out inside and eventually the your central nervous system is uh, is going to completely shut down break down uh and um uh, you would die within just a matter of of a day or even uh, one to three days and um if you get this your odds of surviving are about 30 percent so, you know, one or two out of three people are going to die who, who get bubonic plague. So your odds are not very good, thinking that uh, uh, if we compare to the coronavirus, 99.7 uh, survival rate um, your, your, and your odds of surviving a, uh, 
the Black Death, you would get, uh, your odds are 30%. So, not good. Now we see, uh, as the plague begins to move through Europe, uh, seasonal inflections of this, as uh, uh, within the, uh, uh, the warmer months, uh, we see a, a, a burst in uh, the number of cases as, as fleas, uh, fleas go dormant in winter months in the cold, and uh, therefore we see kind of an abatement of, of uh, the, the, uh, the plague in areas that are colder. And then we see an increase as, as uh, uh, the season becomes warmer. And we also see that northern Europe is less affected by uh, the plague, that they don't have as high of mortality rates as we do in southern Europe, which is much warmer within the Mediterranean climate. So this is just uh, sort of a macro analysis here of the plague. So we need to now look at see how people handled the Black Death, and this is very interesting, particularly uh, within how people have have handled sort of the the uh, responses to the coronavirus. So there is the theological explanation that uh, this is a uh, punishment from God, that uh, it's a divine uh, uh, retribution for a sinful people, meaning that uh, the population had had strayed from the straight and narrow, and, uh, and therefore God was punishing them. So we see these things that are called uh, the penitential movements, and uh, you see these guys called the flagellant uh, that move around Europe, and they would uh, they would come into town, and it was quite a uh, a spectacular show. And they would uh, they would whip themselves, uh, and they would uh, beat the town into a frenzy, uh, and uh, and they would just simply go through, and they would claim that they were taking the sins of of the towns upon them, and that uh, they were were uh, they would mortify their own bodies uh, in order to to take away the the collective sin of uh, of of the world and um they're kind of a, a wild group of, of guys and they, they you didn't really want them to show up and people were afraid of them uh but uh, they were they were popular or that you wouldn't want them to show up if you were one of the town leaders but they were quite popular among the peasantry and they very much believed in the power of these guys and and uh they they often claimed priestly powers as they came through that they would uh that they would take over. They said the clergy were not doing their jobs and, and living, uh, living lavish lifestyles and in and, and, and sin and such. And so they would try to encourage other people to sort of t to become like them and, and do what they uh, were doing in order to get rid of the sin. So uh, it, it really whips the, uh, the peasantry up into uh, quite a frenzy. But it's an interesting movement. So let us look to sort of more to the, the uh, medical or scientific explanation. So the, uh, the faculty, the medical faculty at the University of Montpellier is the most advanced and sophisticated group of physicians that are practicing in, uh, in, in Western Europe. Finest medical facilities, the Harvard Med of, uh, uh, of, of medieval Europe. And so what did the medical faculty at Montpellier recommend? Well, first of all, best piece of advice, get out of plague-ridden areas. If you have the ability to, to leave cities and urban areas that, are, uh, that have plague coming into them, you should do that. Um, you should quarantine victims of plague. So we, we literally see... Um, in many cases, if you come down with the Black Death, they are going. People are going to show up, and they are going to nail you into your house. They are going to put boards up on the doors and windows of your home, and they are going to keep you in your home. And uh, therefore, and in three or four days, they're going to come back. And if you're still alive, then you can come out. Um, so the quarantine was suggested. Uh, then they're going to bleed you. So they, they believed that um, their, their Galenic medical theory was that uh, if you, you had bad blood in you and you had to have a, a proper balance of, your, of the humors of your body, uh, when you 
when you take blood and you just let it set, and once it settles, it uh, there are uh, the black, which is kind of the scab from the the, uh, the healing comes on the top. Uh, then you have the red, the white, and the yellow uh, within your blood. Even you know if you just look at it today. So they believe that there were four humors in your body, and you had to have balance within these. So you had must have bad blood and imbalance within you. So therefore, the best way to get rid of disease is to uh, to bleed you, right? To literally to open you up and take some blood out so therefore your body will produce new and good blood. What other advice might they suggest? Well, they have some dietary advice and there, there's some conflict within this and some suggest you should uh, never eat fish. Then other uh, members of the medical faculty at Montpellier suggest you should actually eat as much fish as possible. Others say you should never eat slimy fish. So all of these were recommended pieces of dietary advice. Um, the uh, another theory was that uh, this was that the Black Death was basically an astrological event uh, that something had happened and it corrupted all the air on Earth. Um, so what can you do in order to prevent the plague from coming to you? Well, you can carry flowers around. Uh, you, you know, think of uh, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Um, well, this actually is a little nursery rhyme that comes right out of the uh, Black Death because it was believed that carrying posy, you could, uh, which is kind of an herb flower, uh, that uh, you could uh, prevent the Black Death. Um, you should burn incense, that you should constantly burn fires to sort of purify the air, this, this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, bad air theory is another serious scientific and medical explanation. Now, the, a, a more of a, a darker theory was that it was uh, the fault of the Jews, that actually uh, the Jews were poisoning Christians and were entirely uh, responsible for this. This leads to more than 100 pogroms against Jewish communities uh, in, in, uh, in the Middle Ages. Eventually, the, even the papacy is going to rule um, that uh, there has to be a ceasing of violence against uh, the Jews, although this had almost no effect. Why were the Jews blamed by the Christians? Well, the Jews had a very strict hygiene uh, rituals that were mandated within their religion and therefore they were far more hygienic than were the christians they had far better sanitation uh, so therefore they did not get plague in the same numbers just simply because of their hygiene and how they how they lived uh, differently than than did uh, uh, their christian brethren so therefore they were seen as they were well these people are immune so therefore they must be uh, poisoning us and and uh, giving us the plague so what were the, the long-term effects of, of the Black Death or the, the uh, Great Dying? Well, it was, it was a landmark uh, event on the memories of, of all the human beings that uh, lived at this time period that if you would describe yourself as living pre- or post-plague, and I predict that uh, the, the effects of, uh, of COVID, will, will, uh, it will be the same, uh, that uh, you would very much describe yourself as it will be pre-COVID and post-COVID uh, sorts of, uh, of a description of time. Um, we see the plague, uh, it, will, it will abate, and it will come back again about every 10 years, uh, and this continues uh, on until the, the 1600s. Um, this is uh, a, a disastrous event for landowners uh, and people who, who, uh, who owned large estates, um, simply because you couldn't find enough people to, to work your farm. So there's a massive uh, labor shortage, and it, and it takes Europe a very long time, almost until uh, 1800, in order for the population to, to, uh, to come back to the same amount um, as, uh, as it did before. Uh, so, so we see it's very, uh, very hard on on uh, um, people who who uh, depended upon laborers in order to to produce their their goods. Um, we also see this as being well quite good. If you survived the Black Death and you were a laborer, uh, you see uh, your the value of your labor increases enormously uh, in in the five years following uh, the play or within uh, within five years your wages will be five to seven times higher. Uh, we also see the price of food decline by over half uh, because there just simply is a, a lot of supply and, and very little demand. Um, so it's very good if you're a laborer, meaning that food is cheap and your labor is expensive. 
So it's good for you as a as a, a, a peasant to be uh, living after the Black Death as long as you, of course, avoided dying during the Black Death. Um, and we see also a, uh, uh, from just sort of a, a, a ecological standpoint uh, that there was no need for all the farmland that had been opened back up. So we see the, the return of many uh, woodlands that had, uh, had previously been hewn down and used for farmland. So uh, uh, again, because of the, the massive uh, contraction of the human population, we see a return of sort of a state of nature in, in many places. Um, so how did, did people sometimes react to this? Well, um, very often there were, well, everywhere throughout Europe, they, they attempted to sort of freeze wages and freeze prices of crops because uh, the nobility wanted the same amounts of money that they were getting um, pre-plague uh, after the, the great dying. And so there were sort of attempts by the nobility to to freeze the the amount of wages that they had to pay a laborer, and they did this at the high, from the highest royal levels, uh, that uh, you could there was sort of a, a maximum uh, wage that could be paid that could be paid, and also there was you, there was a minimum that had to be paid for for uh, the price of of uh, agricultural goods, and this leads to massive uprisings everywhere, um, and uh, and this could not be enforced. Um, just simply because there was so few laborers that uh, they were they were willing to just ignore the law in, in many cases in order to get whoever they could get to, to work their land because there just wasn't anyone left to do so. And peasants refused to, to take such low wages, and this ultimately leads to, to, uh, to massive um, uh, revolts uh, among the peasantry. We see this in the, the Great Peasants' Revolt of 1381 in England, uh, where the the uh, the king had passed and Parliament had passed the statute of laborers in 1351, which did this exact thing. It froze the price of labor to a maximum price that could be paid, and uh, and so therefore there's a, a huge uprising among the the laborers in in England, and they and they win. Uh, well, the king agrees to to uh, uh, th throw out the uh, statute of laborers eventually, uh, but. Uh, uh, they're successful. There's the Jacquerie uh, revolt in France and, the, and then the Ciampi uh, in Italy, and all are over very similar issues. Uh, we also see within art um, and, and uh, uh, this image of death everywhere that people are just fixated on the idea of, of death and mortality, and we see that in this great poem, uh, The Dance of Death, where Death is, is the just the ultimate leveler of all society. That death comes and visits these high figures. He visits uh, he visits emperors. He visits monks. Visits laborers, cardinals, priests, and and how do these people respond to death? And, and uh, uh, how do they? And then how do they dance with death? Do they sort of greet death as an old friend, as they are ready, or are they, have they lived uh, a terrible lifestyle and they are are uh, are, are in enormous fear of death. And we see this within uh, uh, sarcophagi, uh, and uh, is there just simply, an, an there is just a, an obsession uh, uh, of with death and art that reflects death after the period of the great dying. So it's a, it's a very fascinating transformation within art and literature. So this, uh, this concludes our lecture on uh, the grim 14th century. So I hope that you have, have uh, enjoyed this and, uh, and come to learn something uh, about uh, why uh, this, this century was one of particular stresses upon society and how society was able to, to, uh, to react to this. And, and really within our own uh, current situation, this, this should have some resonance with you. So thanks for watching, and until next time, stay healthy.